Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so again, my name is McConnell Sandaji. I'm serving as the Southern California Black Community Programs Director. And um, welcome to PU ABC. This is a this is a, a new program that we're starting, and it's a part of our effort as the African Black Coalition to not only um, you know be intentional with our labor and our work in organizing, but understanding that we're not just building laborers and workers, but we're also building thinkers and intellectuals and that, you know, the, the greatest of our ancestors understood that importance, right? That balance between work and action, thought and action, um, theory and practice. So this, is, this, this program is what we hope to be the start of, you know, everything that, is, that, that comes with being a, a true, right? You know, a person who practices and a person who theorizes, someone who reads and someone who works. So that's what we're here to do. So it seems like we have a good number of folks on here. Um, and this isn't going to be a, a, a straight one way sort of, you know, um, delivery of information. I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible. There will be different opportunities where I'll kind of pose a question to everyone. And how we can answer those questions is if we, we're gonna utilize the, the chat room or the chat, you know, group chat um, on the call. So what I'll do is whenever an opportunity comes for, you know, um, you all to give your input, I'll type the question or whatever it is in the group chat and then you can just send your responses that way. And then we'll, I'll kind of read through them together. And then, you know, if, if someone um, shares something in the group chat and they wish to speak on it further, um, you know, just indicate so in the chat, or you can raise your hand um, via Zoom, and I'll be able to see that, and then we can we can share that way. But for the most part, at least with this first lesson, um, you know, it'll just be showcasing some of our greatest of warriors and scholars and thinkers. So you just really get to sit back and and, and enjoy that. So let's go ahead and get straight into it. Here we go. Pull that up. Um, so what I'm sharing now, I'm sharing my screen. This is the, you know, the official beginning of um, this lesson this evening. If anyone has any issues, you know, seeing it or, or, or viewing it, um, just indicate so in the chat and I'll be able to try to fix that. Um, so again, Ilumu Uhuru is a Swahili phrase that means freedom education. And as the African Black Coalition, we are striving day in and day out to not only affirm this as an idea, but actually manifest it in our tangible work. The African Black Coalition's tangible work is organizing Black college students, right? So that's the tangible, right? And, and with that tangible work comes organizing Black college students to obtain resources, intellectual resources, economic resources to build political power, right? And then not only to build political power in order to um, create our own political uh, agenda, but also work on building the necessary apparatus to enact that agenda. Um, I think where we sometimes fall short in our organizing effort is that we, we, we focus on right, the agenda, um, the points of action, the principles and the values, and we do need to focus on those things. And with focusing on those things, we also have to focus on, right, the apparatus. It isn't enough to just have an agenda and no place or no means by which to enact it. So Ilimu Uhuru is our effort to not only build our agenda, but also enact it through an apparatus. So today's lesson, this evening's lesson, is discussing um, revolutionary warriors of Africa. And by no means is this an exhaustive list, you know, if this isn't um, everyone literally throughout our history were the oldest people on the planet. So, you know, our history is, is near infinity. So for us to even attempt to um, name all of our significant warriors, we would be here for much longer than, you know, seven to eight or seven to nine. We would be here for some days and some, you know, weeks on end. Um, so this is just a, a, an essential list um, of our warriors. Um, and, you know, we understand that we're a global people, so this isn't just um, particular individuals who thought a certain way, talked a certain way, moved a certain way. We, we, we're sure to 
be as um, you know, wide ranging in our coverage um, of our revolutionary warriors. So let's go ahead and get into it. So our first warrior, we have Thomas Sankara. Thomas Sankara, um, he seized power in 1983, popularly supported coup at the age of 33. Um, he was the first prime minister of Burkina Faso, and he had a goal of eliminating corruption and the dominance of the former French colonial power. Burkina Faso was a, um, a West African nation, and a large majority of um, West Africa was under French colonial rule. He launched one of the most ambitious programs for social and economic change ever attempted on the African continent. Um, also, with this list of folks, how, just as it is an exhaustive list, each of the facts that are given are by no means everything you know that needs to be known on each of these folks. There's definitely further research to be done. Um, this is just a, a sort of a, a fundamental analysis, if you will, on each of these people. Um, so this is Thomas Sankara. And then what we have, um, we also have uh, one of his quotes that he said, he said that the revolution and women's liberation go together. We do not talk of women's emancipation as an act of charity or because of a surge of human compassion. It is a basic necessity for the triumph of the revolution. Women hold up the other half of the sky. And this is very, very critical for us to not only read and understand, but to pass on to our friends, our comrades, our loved ones, because there's a, uh, uh, a danger we, we sort of encounter when we talk about our leaders and we talk about you know people who have, have made significant contributions to history. Um, and what I mean by that is we don't necessarily um, view African leaders or African warriors or soldiers as these people who had very, very um, thorough and in some ways progressive um, ways of thinking, right? They're, they were very complex in a, in a constructive way. Thomas Sankara is a prime example of that. Um, so the nation Burkina Faso was actually um, named Upper Volta prior to it. Um, Thomas Sankara renamed it to Burkina Faso and it means land of upright men. And um, some more details on that ambitious economic program. It entailed that no one was above farm work or graveling roads, not even the president, government ministers, or army officers. Intellectual and civic education were systematically integrated with military training, and soldiers were required to work in local community development projects. These two bullet points alone, I can't think of very many nations anywhere on the globe that operate this way. What Thomas Sankara aims to do with Burkina Faso was, was very much revolutionary. Um, moving on to uh, Mitty Maud Lena Gordon. Um, she was a black nationalist who established the peace movement of Ethiopia. Now the peace movement of Ethiopia was an organization that advocated for black immigration to West Africa in response to racial discrimination and white supremacy. A lot of the, and we'll learn this um, next week, in the origins of black nationalism. The basic principles or the, 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 the major organizing um, objective of early black nationalism was in fact black immigration. And not immigration, I-M-M, -M, but emigration, E-M-I. Um, and what emigration is defined as is, is moving to another location, right? Relocating essentially. Um, so, Mitty Maud, Lena Gordon established the peace movement, which was one of the more prominent um, black nationalist organizations that advocated for black immigration. Um, this is an interesting fact. Due to her affiliation with Japanese politicians and Japanese members of the Pacific Movement of the Eastern World, as well as the Black Dragon Society in the early 1940s, she was put under surveillance by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So, this sister is very, very unique. And what part of what makes her so unique is that, again, we, we can see this, this last bullet point, right? We can't think of very many um, of our leaders who um, were known for their transnational um, or global affiliations, right? Uh, another premise of early Black nationalist organizing was a very strong um, undertone of transnationalism. And what transnationalism is, is it's the, you know, effort to not only build and organize your own where you live and where you know 
you you reside, but not only demonstrating solidarity with global or with overseas organizing efforts, but actually joining forces, sharing resources, those types of things. In October 1942, she was arrested for conspiring with the Japanese, quote, an enemy nation of the United States during the World War, the Second World War, and she spent the majority of those war years in jail. Um, here we have, um, she was also a practitioner of internationalist organizing politics. Um, it's similar to the aims of Pan-Africanism. We'll learn about this um, in two weeks. Um, that none of us is free until all of us are free. This last point is very, very crucial. Um, if you have a, you know, a pen or something, make a note of this. She was considered to be a black nationalist woman with a proto-feminist consciousness. What a proto-feminist consciousness is defined, um, defined as is an opposition to gender inequality that predated the feminist movements of the 1960s and 70s. This is a very critical term because oftentimes in, in contemporary organizing, we understand um, you know, feminism a certain way, but we don't investigate any presence of feminist thinking or ideologies prior to feminism actually becoming a thing. And this is actually, um, Keisha Blaine does this in her book, Set the World on Fire. Um, she describes Mitty Maud as a, a, a subject in her book, and she describes this proto-feminist consciousness. Um, so again, that's, that's very, very crucial for us to know and understand. Uh, moving on, Steve Biko, he was a South African revolutionary, the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement. He encouraged Blacks to recognize their inherent dignity and self-worth. Um, in the 1970s, the Black Consciousness Movement spread from university campuses into urban Black communities throughout South, South Africa. This is important. When we think about what it means to organize for social justice or for, you know, revolutionary change, um, we rarely see a, a synthesis of organizing between college campuses, university campuses, and the surrounding communities. Steve Biko and the Black Consciousness Movement not only did this, but they did it well, right? Synthesizing both efforts, both struggles. And that's really what is necessary if that effort, if that struggle is to be successful, right? Um, some other facts, he was expelled from high school for his political activism. Um, in 1968, he co-founded the All Black South African Students Organization. And um, this organization was based on the philosophy of black consciousness. And one of his quotes, we must remove from our vocabulary completely the concept of fear. Moving on, we have um, Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba was the first and last elected prime minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, we'll get into what first and last um, means in a little bit. In October 1958, he created the Congolese National Movement, the first nationwide Congolese political party. He proclaimed his regime one of positive neutralism, which he defined as a return to African values and rejection of any imported ideology, including that of the Soviet Union, another key term. So our, our first key term was proto-feminist consciousness. Another key term you can uh, make a note of is positive neutralism. And our brother Patrice um, was assassinated in a plot conceived by Belgium and the US government. So Congo was under Belgian um, colonial rule. And the reason why the first fact that said he was the first and last elected prime minister um, was because in his efforts establishing the Congolese national movement and upon his being elected, um, he, he was facing, you know, um, threats of, of coups and of being overthrown before he was even elected. Um, and he, he only served as prime minister for around three months um, until his assassination was carried out um, by his enemies. And then he said that the day will come when history will speak. Africa will write its own history and it will be a history of glory and dignity. Uh, moving on to Yeya Santiwa. Um, she was the queen mother of the Ashanti peoples during the beginning of the 20th century. In 1896, the Ashanti peoples began to rebel against the British presence in their lands and the British attempt to construct, quote, the Gold Coast colony. To retaliate, the British captured and exiled Asante Hene Prempe I, king of the Ashanti, and Asante was grandson Kofi Tene, who was also a powerful leader. 
the British removed the king and other Ashanti leaders to the Seychelles Islands in an effort to acquire the Golden Stool. Uh, Ye Santua's leadership and, and passion led her to her role as commander in chief of the Ashanti army. In turn, the Anglo Ashanti Wars, fifth and final war against the British, became known as the, as the Ye Santua War of Independence, or the War of the Golden Stool, which began on March 28, 1900. She led the rebellion and became an image of strength and resistance. She was captured during the rebellion and exiled to Seychelles, where she died in 1921. Um, and this quote comes from the just bef just prior to that fifth and final war of independence um, starting. She's this this was around the time um, that if we can go back um, during this time where we have. Um, the British capturing and, and exiling the Ashanti's leadership, um, the community organized and, you know, called a, a, a council meeting, in essence, and um, most of the men who organized it were afraid. They didn't know what to do. They, they weren't sure if they should fight back or surrender. And the Ashanti wall stood up and said, is it true that the bravery of the Ashanti is no more? I cannot believe it. It cannot be. I must say this. If you, the men of Ashanti, will not go forward, then we will. We, the women, will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men. We will fight to the last of us falls in the battlefields. So we can see a, a true warrior in every sense of the word, the Asante I was. Moving on, we have um, Thimbisili, or Chris Hani. He was exposed to political thought from a very young age through his father, Gilbert Hani, who was active in the African National Congress. Active in campus protests over the takeover of Fort Hare by the Department of Bantu Education. Um, so Chris Hani was another South African revolutionary. Um, his frustration with apartheid drove him to join the South African Communist Party in 1961. Um, he was one of the um, principal organizers and the political commissar in the Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army. Um, there were several assassination attempts on his life, including at least one car bomb. He was the only political leader with influence over the radical township and the self-defense self groups that had parted from the authority of the ANC. Um, unfortunately, his assassination was carried out by his enemies um, April 10th, 1993. And he said that if you want peace, then you must struggle for social justice. Um, going back briefly, um, Chris Hani is unique in the sense that um, he was an African revolutionary and in his growth of revolutionary consciousness, um, we can see this third um, bullet point is that you know his frustration with apartheid actually drove him to join the south african communist party in 1961 and it's important for us to know this because we need to be able to investigate and interpret our african revolutionaries as being um diverse um in their thinking right in their ideology so just because they're african we can't just assume they were they subscribe to a particular ideology or a particular school of thought chris Hani is a prime example of no, you know, African revolutionaries, you know, they, they exercise all means, ideolog ideological and practical, right, in order to achieve um, their goals. And Chris Hani said that if you want peace, then you must struggle for social justice. Moving on, another warrior of ours, um, Amy Jacques Garvey. Um, she was, in 1923, she edited and po published volume one of the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. She released volume two later in 1925. She also edited the UNIA's um, newspaper, The Negro World. UNIA stands for the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the um, Black Nationalist Organ Organization um, founded by Marcus Garvey and his first wife, um, Amy Ashford Garvey. In 1944, she wrote a memorandum correlative of Africa, West Indies, and the Americas, which she used to convince the UN representative to adopt an African Freedom Charter. By 1963, she published her own book, Garvey and Garveyism, and later published two collections of essays, Black Power in America and The Impact of Garvey in Africa and Jamaica. Amy Jacques Garvey is, is a true definition of um, scholar warrior, right, of, of, of thinker fighter. Um, and we can see um, how this is demonstrated in the sense that not only was she a, a a powerful intellectual in the sense that she published books and essays, and but she also wrote, we can see this um, third bullet point, wrote a memorandum to the United Nations. And again, we 
see a demonstration, if we think back to Mitty Ma and Lena Gordon, there's a demonstration of this internationalistic, um, you know, effort demonstrated by black nationalists. So Amy Jalkas Garvey, Mitty Ma and Lena Gordon are prime examples of black nationalists who understood that this is a, a global struggle, right? And a global fight, right? If to, to limit it to just, you know, where you currently reside in that nation, you're, you're never going to achieve total victory. And Amy Garvey said, the doll baby type of woman is a thing of the past. And the wide awake woman is forging ahead, prepared for all emergencies and ready to answer any call, even if it be to face the cannons on the battlefield. Uh, moving on, we have Ahmed Sekou Toure. He was the first president of Guinea. Um, in 1956, he was nominated as the mayor of Conakry and elected a deputy to the French National Assembly in Paris. Guinea is a very, very um, small West African nation, just above um, Ghana. In 1957, um, he was elected to the vice president of Guinea, um, soon empowered to form the colony's first autonomous government under control of a French governor. And then in October 2nd, on October 2nd, 1958, he proclaimed Guinea's independence, um, making it the first West African country liberated from French governance. Um, this is interesting because we can see the evolution of revolution in Guinea um, through Seco Touré, so, right? So, and what I mean by that is in the, in the course of two years, right, he organizes and, and pursues um, different objectives that all lead up to the ultimate goal of true independence. And so we can look at his first achievement here, 1956, nominated mayor, right? So he starts off, um, I don't wanna say starts off small, but starts off, you know, on one level. Then the next year he's, you know, organizes and builds up to a, a, a bigger level. And then the following year, you know, the ultimate goal is achieved. And that's important for us to understand because we should not, we cannot think of our revolution um, and the fight for our independence as a sort of one event or one happening or just one stop and boom, we're there, right? There's a, a, a revolutionary process that has to take place that involves different events over some years. And Seco Touré is a prime example of that. And he said that, Thus, on the level of pure knowledge, on the level of universal knowledge, the education dispensed in Africa was deliberately inferior and limited to those disciplines in which, to, limited to those disciplines which would allow the better exploitation of the population. Seiko Ture was a, another, you know, scholar warrior, understanding not just how colonial education on the continent of Africa um, functioned, right, but why and what it was for, right? Um, Seko Ture developed close links with Ghana under Kwame Nkrumah. He sought economic support from the Soviet Union, China, and the U.S. He developed pan-African ideologies, combining efforts with other African leaders to establish a union of African states, and he was influential in the founding of the organization African Unity. We're going to learn about the organization African Unity um, when we discuss the origins of Pan-Africanism. Um, again, another demonstration of the transnational nature of African revolutionary organizing, right? Each of the, uh, the warriors that we've learned about thus far knew, and not only did they know, but they acted on, right, the interests of pursuing revolution, right, outside of their own nation, outside of their own sort of scope. Right, understanding that none of us is free and all of us are, until all of us are free and putting that into practice. So we learned about, again, this, this was far from a, uh, an exhaustive list. Um, this is only a few, right, of, a, of a, the tip of the iceberg and the iceberg itself is, is huge, right? Um, and it's important when we think about learning from and learning about our historical figures and you know the, the the greatest of our people it's it's the question of how do we pay homage right how do we acknowledge those contributions and continue the legacy how do we live up to what has been laid down for us and that's a tough question to really grapple with um and uh you know we we try to answer it with more teachings from our ancestors um emil Carr cabral 
was um, the um, principal revolutionary in Guinea-Bissau, another very small um, West African nation um, under Portuguese colonial rule. Emil Carl Cabral said that for us as Africans, the best homage we can pay to Kwame Nkrumah and his immortal memory is reinforced vigilance in all fields of the struggle, more strongly developed and intensified struggle, the total liberation of Africa, success in development and economic, social, and cultural progress for our peoples, and in the building of African unity. This was, that was the fundamental aim of Kwame Nkrumah's action and thought. This is the oath we should all take before history in respect of the African continent. Um, and while our ancestor here is speaking directly of Kwame Nkrumah, I believe we can apply this to all of our ancestors, right? All of our revolutionary warriors, right? The best homage we can pay is to pick up their work where they left off and continue it, right? Broaden it, right? Reinforce your vigilance in all fields of the struggle. Right. Of course, we we um, learn about and we, you know, analyze the historical contributions of our ancestors. But by no means does that mean we, we stop or we stop fighting, we stop struggling. Right. If we think of a, a, the Sankofa bird, which is a symbol used throughout um, African education um, and just, you know, African culture, the Sankofa bird symbolizes going back and fetching that which you have lost. And Sankofa is actually um, an Akan word. Um, Akan is, the, is the, the name of the um, people in Ghana, West Africa. Um, it means literally go back and fetch that which you have lost, right? And if we think about the position, if you Google Sankofa bird, the image pops up, the symbol pops up. And when you look at the position of the bird, the bird is facing forward with its neck, its head turned back. I think we can apply this symbol to our work when, and how that can be applied is we're doing it right now. We're facing forward, but we're looking back and learning from our revolutionary warriors of Africa. Emil Cabral, what he's saying is practice St. Kofa, right? Pay homage to your ancestors through reinforced work, right? Don't just, don't, the St. Kofa bird isn't totally facing backwards and facing what the, what the bird is looking at. The bird is facing forward right? Looking back, learning with the intentions of applying what is being learned in a forward and a constructive direction. That's what we need to do here. Um, and Walter Rodney, um, a Guyanese revolutionary, um, said that we don't regard ourselves as adventurers, as martyrs, or potential martyrs, but we think there's a job which needs to be done, and at a certain point in time, we have to do what has to be done. This is a very, um, poignant and and you know concise way of saying you you know of, of answering this question of how we pay homage right there's a job that has to be done and a job that has to be done needs to be taken up by those who will or who are you know who intend to do the job right if we think back again to the same colorful bird right we're not just here to learn and to read and to you know, feel good by what we're learning, but to actually take it and apply it, to live up to what it means to be a scholar warrior, right? A, a thinker and a practitioner, right? To synthesize action and thought, right? And, and we don't, as Walter Rodney says, we don't take it up as this, you know, um, adventurous and, and, you know, um, magnanimous um, duty, but we just say, all right, a job has to be done. Let's learn what we need to, and then do the job. So really, um, if we can answer um, this question in our own words, let's do so um, in our chat box. Um, so after learning from these African revolutionaries, um, answer that question, right? How do we pay homage to our ancestors? And, you know, it doesn't have to be this, um, you know, super poetic or, or, you know, um, deep answer, <laughs> but just think practically, right? How do we um, pay homage to our ancestors? So I'm gonna put the question in the chat. Um, how do we pay homage to our ancestors? And just think for a moment um, how we can do this. Think about 
what Walter Rodney has shared with us, right? Think about what Emil Carr Cabral teaches us, right? Think about the work that Minnie Marlena Gordon did, what Yaya Santiwa did, right? Think about the work that Sekou Touré, um, you know, manifested. Think about all those different things. And now answer this question of how do we pay homage to our ancestors? I'll give everyone um, a brief moment to, to type in their answers and then um, as you all type in your answers, um, I'm just gonna read them out loud um, and then we can sort of discuss, you know, what, what, what we shared so far. Okay, so have a few responses here. Um, to the question of how do we pay homage to our ancestors, um, we have Brother Khalil, peace brother, he says, um, to build on their writing, philosophy, and theories, I like that. Um, for my brother Taharka, peace brother, applying the values and principles in our organizing efforts. Mm, that's a good one. Um, let's highlight that briefly. Um, applying the values and principles, right? And this goes back to what we discussed in the beginning, um, in terms of how do we, as individuals in today's day and age, right, look at what our ancestors have contributed, not only to us, but to history, you know, in general, to society, to the world at large. And Kwame Ture, Kwame Ture has this quote, he says that the best way, um, the best way to get a people to do something or to be something is to be the best example of that. So applying the values and principles in our organizing efforts is absolutely the prime way that we can embody, right, the um, revolutionary fire that our ancestors possessed and still possess to this day, right? A few other folks, okay, how do we pay homage? Through dance and movement, okay, I like that. To attain this knowledge, understand it, apply it, and go and teach others. There we go. We have that that prac that that process of sankofa, right? Not just obtaining knowledge, um, you know, receiving it for ourselves, holding on to it, and then you know, getting ahead in life, quote unquote, getting ahead um, as an individual, right? If anything, for us to sit, learn, and not teach what we've learned is to betray what we have learned and the and the contributors of that knowledge, right? Okay, we pay homage through first learning our true history and then teaching others by also applying and living to those same values in our lives. Okay, that's real. Got to practice what we preach, right? It isn't enough. Um, like, like it wouldn't make sense if um, I was the, you know, um, teacher of the PE with ABC program and then I don't practice the values and principles of ABC, right? If, if I'm a, um, if I'm teaching the Revolutionary Wars of Africa class, but I don't really mess with Africa. That's a, a contradiction, <laughs> right, in and of itself. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, I guess remember what they did and why, where that's gotten to us now, and use that memory to ensure we utilize our current positions in the best way that we can. Okay, I like that. Okay, pay homage by sharing the knowledge, adapting it to, re to reflect in our organizing efforts. Right, but Isaiah, peace, good brother, learn from our ancestors and work until our people are liberated. Yes, sir, that's, that's, that's what we're here to do. Um, mm, 
Sister Jada said, we ensure that the lives and deaths of our ancestors are not in vain. Allow their spirit to sharpen us. That's beautiful. And we'll touch on it real briefly. Um, I can't remember who said it, um, but it was this um, ancestor of ours who said that our ancestors do not die and that our ancestors only die when we stop speaking their names, when we stop thinking about them in the work that we do. Right. And Marimba Ani, who's an um, um, African psychologist and a, um, like a behavioral scientist, Marimba Ani talks about our ancestors living with us and not in a physical form, but in a spiritual and a mental form. And that's important for us to understand so that we don't think or mistakenly think that our ancestors are quote unquote gone. Right. By no means are they gone. That's a good one, Jada. Thank you. Oh yeah, are we getting looks in the in the chat? This is beautiful. Learning our true history, organizing our people, right? Put our people first to make it a mission to have positive and efficient relationships with each other in our day to day lives. Mm, we should also unlearn and relearn our history and and incorporate that into everything we do. That's crucial. We can think about learning our history like um. Well, we can think about this process of unlearning and relearning our history as if let's say um you know from from birth um you have fuzzy eyesight right you have you have bad vision and you neglect getting glasses or getting you know eye treatments to to better your vision so in a sense you're you're walking around right with with um vision that that is flawed and can be improved right that's like that 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 can be correlated to us learning that which is is not good for us, that which is detrimental to us, and that the minute that we put on the pair of glasses that helps us see, we've started that process of unlearning and relearning our true history. And if any of us knows what it feels like to not be able to see or to have trouble seeing, that can be a a, a frightening thing. And then we also know the relief that we feel once we are able to see, once our vision is restored. So that's very, very important. I appreciate everyone for answering. We all got loose in here. That's good. So in conclusion, um, let me see how you do this. Still figuring out Zoom. There we go. Boom. Um, so some of our key terms, um, I wrote them up here. Proto-feminist consciousness, that comes from Minnie Maud Lena Gordon. And from this book in particular, um, Keisha Blaine set the word on fire. If, um, if there's any sort of questioning around, well, what's the role of um, black women in black nationalism? This book puts all those questions, um, or answers all those questions, I should say, um, proto-feminist consciousness. And to remind us, proto-feminist consciousness is the idea of being in opposition to gender inequality prior to feminism and the feminist movements that came in the 1960s and 1970s. Then we had positive neutralism, right? Positive neutralism came from um, Patrice Lumumba's um, Congolese national movement, right? And if we can think, well, actually, I'm gonna pose a question to everyone to see if any of us can remember. I'll put it back up um, on the screen. Um, if any of us can remember, uh, what positive neutralism is, um, let's go back to it, let's see. Boom. Positive neutralism as a return to African values and rejection of any important ideology. So if we go back um, to our question of how do we pay homage to our ancestors, um, Sister Camille Turner says, um, we should also unlearn and relearn our history and incorporate that into everything we do. So there's a, a, a prime example, right, of positive neutral, neutralism um, being practiced, right? Rejecting any imported ideology, any imported thinking or behavior, right? And receiving, right, a return to African values, a return to African principles. That's very, very important. Um, so again, Ilimu Uhuru. Um, put it in the chat. Who remembers what that phrase means? Let's see. Ilimu Uhuru is just it's, it's two words in Swahili. Um, and we use it um, 
to to freedom education. There we go. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Freedom education. <laughs> Targets at <are> death. <laughs> Elimu Uhuru. Yes, indeed. Freedom education. Elimu Uhuru is the African Black Coalition's tangible effort, our tangible response, our direct action to building up thinkers and intellectuals, just as we build up laborers, workers, and soldiers, right? Our greatest of, of ancestors were the sharpest of thinkers and the fiercest of fighters, right? So it's our job, it's our duty today to build up that generation, that fleet of sharp thinkers and fierce fighters. That's what an emu who means. That's what we're here for, right? Um, if any folks have any questions, um, would like to go back to a slide, um, anything like that, please put it in the chat now um, and we can address that. This um, presentation, along with all future presentations, um, are made available via the P with ABC syllabus. Um, can we go back to the, absolutely. Um, so yeah, on the P with ABC syllabus, um, we all have access or whoever receives the syllabus will have access um, to the presentations. And on the syllabus, um, there is recommended reading sources um, for each topic. Um, and then also, um, along with questions and comments in the chat, um, if folks can put in the chat, if they had any trouble um, either receiving emails from myself, or if um, maybe you didn't get the syllabus or anything like that, any questions or concerns that anyone may have, please um, put it in the chat and we'll get it handled. Positive neutralism, there it is. A return to African studies. And I'll write that um, positive neutralism up here too. Um, And then it's positive neutralism as a return to African values and a rejection of imported ideology. And when we think economically, what it means to import is to, if I'm um, a nation, um, I'm the blue nation, right? I'm just kind of speaking hypothetically. I'm the blue nation. Um, I can import, uh, let's say, tennis balls. What that means is I, the Blue Nation do not produce tennis balls myself. I get them from somewhere else, right? I get it from, I don't know, the Green Nation, right? The Green Nation, in that sense, would export tennis balls and the Blue Nation, me, would import them. So when Patrice Lumumba is talking about rejecting imported ideology, he's saying rejecting ideology that does not come from you, does not come from your people or your group, right? Rejection of imported, ideology or space. So again, if anyone has any questions or concerns, um, they want to go back to a slide or want to talk about something that they saw, um, please put it in the chat and we will cover it. Imported. Ideology. Oh, I tried to fit it there. Okay. Um, let's go back to the Yeasanti was slide, no problem. Um, it's two slides, so I'll, I'll go to, actually this one's probably has a more tangible information. Um, will we be able to have access to the recordings of these lessons? Yes, yes. Um, as soon as the meeting ends, um, I will um, just go through the recording, make sure, you know, audio's clear, video's clear. And then yes, um, the, actually that's a good question. Um, so once the meeting is over, you all will receive an email with a post um, course or a post lesson assessment. And it'll go through your email. The same email that I sent out the Zoom link to, it'll be a response to that. Um, so in that email, you'll receive two things. You'll receive the post assessment form. Um, and please, 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 please fill that out. Um, and then, um, you receive that, and then you'll, you'll also receive the recording for this lesson. Yes, indeed. Um, Tarak asked, how do you respond to those who say Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism are old hotep 
or you put Hotep, oh yeah, Hotep, yeah. Hotep ideologies that have no relevance to the liberation of African black women. Um, good question. Um, and this is key for us to understand as scholars and as thinkers that we should always, 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 when we are being um, questioned or challenged in terms of the information that we're delivering, right? If we're being challenged in any kind of way, we should always um, remember to respond from a place of fact and a place of evidence and a place of truth, right? And to refrain from um, reacting emotionally or, or, or in a way that isn't your complete thought, right? And talk, I actually learned this from you. Don't respond to people um, who are challenging you unless you can give them, right, or respond with your complete thought. So take time, right? So to answer your question, Tarker, how do you, I respond to those who say Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism are old Hotep ideologies? Um, I would plain and, simply, plain and simply say that isn't true. And I would cite um, Keisha Blaine's Set the World on Fire, and I would just suggest, hey, you know, flip through a couple pages of this. Um, and if you don't want to read the book, you can look up book reviews of the book. <laughs> and, and you can, you know, go through that and your question, um, you know, will be answered in saying, no, that isn't true. Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism are not hotel ideologies. And in fact, if there is any ideology that is most relevant and most pertinent to the liberation of African Black women, I would argue that it's Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism. Let's see. Uh, put the family. Boom, boom, boom. So um, again, any other questions or um, let me go ahead and stop this. Any other questions or concerns or you know anything that is on our minds at this point in time? Um, I have it up here again. Um, positive neutralism. I tried to fit in um, important ideology, um, and these are two very important terms. Um, that we have to understand, not only in our effort um, to undergo that process of unlearning and relearning. Um, who is the author of the book? Keisha Blaine, Keisha and Blaine, right here, boom. And this is a, a fairly recent um, book. This came out 2006, 2018. Um, so when we think about, you know, um, old hotel ideology, we can point to very recent books that say, no, um, this was published two years ago. And it is literally, the, the full title is Set the World on Fire, Black Nationalist Women and the Global Struggle for Freedom. So I imagine that in this book, he should not only talks about the relevance of black nationalism to African black women, but the application of it as an ideology, right, to African black women. Um, so that's important for us to know. Um, let me put that um, in the chat as well. Set the world on fire. Keisha and Blaine. Boom. Oh, wait, hold on. Set the world. So again, if anyone has any further questions or concerns, um, be on the lookout um, for an email from me um, soon um, with two things. The recording of this meeting um, and the post assessment um, form. And again, um, your feedback is valuable. So from that form, we'll be able to assess how we can improve, um, how we can just get better at doing this whole PE with ABC thing. Um, so if there are no further questions or anything like that, um, we can go ahead um, and that concludes our lesson for the day. Um, for the evening. We appreciate you all. Um, again, my name is McCormick Tendaji. I'm the SoCal Black Community Programs Director for the African Black Coalition, and I appreciate you all um, for tuning in.